Yay! Woo! Hi, everybody. Oh, I do love this moment when all your faces, like, they all populate at once. Like, just, it, it comes like popcorn, like, really, really, really fast. I'm so happy to see you again. Hi. I'm scrolling to the next page so I can see everybody else. Guys, here we are again. Thank you for being the fierce happy hour people <laughs> every single week in the middle of the day. Thank you for whatever you're doing to make that happen. I'm happy to see you. Cheers, everybody. Do you have snacks? Do you have drinks? I don't know. Do we? Yay. Oh, good. Oh, that somebody's, it's five o'clock somewhere. I mean, I see a couple of you like kicking back a little. It's fine. Fine. It's like week 11. <laughs> Teens in quarantine. How is everybody doing? Like, are we just making it? Are we just making it? I don't even know. I, the boys walked in this morning and I was making breakfast. And I was like, oh, good morning. I'm happy to see you. Here's some breakfast. Everybody needs to get a job. Like, have a great day. I mean, because it's really been summer since March 5th. And so it's enough. Everybody's had enough. I've had enough of them. It's enough of this house. I'm like, I want you to live. I do. But there's masks. Okay. Get out of this house with your mask and just go make some money and stop asking me to cook your food. I'm over it. Um, so I don't know if you guys saw this. This is just a little housekeeping. My oldest son got a real person's job, a grown up person's job that's like uses a degree that we paid for. And it has like a real grown up person's salary. And he was like, mom, it just happened. I'm like, what happened? He's like, I just crossed over from being an adult, which everybody has been telling me since I was 18 to being a grown up. And he's like, now I'm grown up. I'm like, good, pay your insurance, pay your cell phone. Then, then I will call you a GU, a grown up. Um, so that feels really exciting that we have offloaded one, um, four to go. <laughs> God. Um, okay. I, let me say this quick little thing to everybody that is tuning in. First of all, I'm happy that you're here and that you're with us live. There's something fun about being on live together. I, cause we're all just actually having this moment at the same time. And that feels special. Um, some of you are watching via the Vimeo link and you're like, why am I not on the zoom? with those girls. Um, and so let me just kind of remind you if you missed this last week. Um, originally we were gonna host the Fierce Happy Hour on like a mega Zoom, like a massive mega Zoom where every single person, like Chrissy, how many was it? How many did we think it was gonna be able to ha have? 10,000? 10, yep, 10,000. Yep. Yeah, 10,000 people. I'm like, well, that seems fun. It'll just be like 75 pages of Zoom. Well, we're going to do that. And they're like, great, you can do that. And what will cost you is $10,000 um, per Zoom. And we were like, well, that feels mean. Um, that feels expensive. And so because that wasn't a possibility, I am on a Zoom call with the OG members of the Jen Hatmaker Book Club. So these were women who signed up for the book club last June in its inaugural month. And they have been in it ever since. And so we invited them to be a part of the live Zoom. And then the rest of you are watching us. This is real time. This is live. We're, you're watching us live also, but this is that's the broadcast version on Vimeo. So thank you for understanding that $10,000 per Zoom felt a little steep. Okay. Come on, quarantine. Like, give us some options. Okay, this week, you guys, this is, like, I had to calm myself down about an hour ago. I'm like, calm down. You're, this isn't your pulpit. You're not preaching. But I think I might. I think I might accidentally preach um, today. And I was trying to take cleansing breaths because I feel so, these are the conversations that run deep in my, in my bones, as you know. Um, this is just the way it had worked out, but as it turns out, the week in Fierce Happy Hour Week 4, we are dealing with the section called What I Believe. And the two chapters in that section that you have read and that we sent you all 
the workbook for to really grab you by the hand and work you through the walk you through the paces a little bit because sometimes somebody just needs to ask you some really specific questions to even figure out what it is you think to even figure it out what it is you believe or how you got there what the steps were and so i hope everybody is using that incredible digital workbook it is such a great resource but anyway um the two chapters that this week addresses is i believe in spiritual curiosity and i would march for this cause. What did I actually call it? I believe in this cause. I think that's what I called it. I believe in this cause. Well, these are conversations the whole world seems to be having right now, just right on time. Um, this is just right on time for us as a community to really hold up to the light and to examine and to discuss together. And this is such a wonderful community to do it inside of. Um, for those of you who are new or you're peeking in the windows here of what this is, um, this is a very beautiful and safe place um, to discuss important and complicated and hard things. Um, it's a charitable community and we are really committed to honoring truth and goodness and each other inside of these discussions. And so I'm glad that you're here. And I, I think that you will be glad as well. So let me tell you for me, um, as we take look at these two key ideas from Fierce, Free and Full of Fire. By the way, if anybody has no idea what I'm talking about, it's a book I wrote. <laughs> Some people just wandered into the Vimeo link. They're like, what are these people doing? Um, we're going through a book I wrote section by section, Fierce, Free, okay. Um, when we're talking about these two big ideas, spiritual curiosity, and advocacy. I'm actually just going to talk about them together. Um, I'm not going to parse these out. We're not going to deal with chapter nine and then chapter 10, because for me, both of these things, spiritual curiosity and advocacy, they arced together for me. They were absolutely on a parallel trajectory and one informed the other and vice versa. So what I mean by that is in my personal life, let me just, let me walk back one step real quick. Let me say this real quick. Uh, whoever is joining us today, I do 100% know we come to spiritual conversations from a million places. Um, we have, we it, represented here is every kind of faith background, including none. Um, some of us are still invested somewhere in a faith community. Some of us walked away. Um, we are kind of all over the map on style and preference and theology and doctrine and denomination, all of it. And I think that's wonderful. That's a wonderful thing. And so whoever you are, however it is you find yourself inside a conversation on faith, um, things that are spiritual, and then even some of the institutions like the church, that those ideas um, deeply impact, obviously, you're welcome here. Okay, you're very, very welcome here. And I think it is in the diversity of our experiences and our perspectives um, that we really have a fighting shot at figuring out what's true and good, right? Um, it's just only when we have that really myopic thing, like this is the only thing we ever heard, the only thing we have ever known, the only thing we've ever learned, um, the only experience we've ever borne witness to. Now then we might need to do some deep examination, right? But in this case, in the breadth of this community, I think what we have, um, is a real diverse point of view that'll serve this conversation. So you're welcome here, no matter where you are, from one end to the other or anywhere in between on faith. Okay, for me, one of the very first things that deeply compelled me toward spiritual curiosity was injustice. So I, I can't separate these out. These these together in my, these were together um, because from a spiritual standpoint, what I noticed was that certain doctrines um, and structures, and in some cases, let's be honest, just silence, silence from the church, silence from the faith community. I noticed that that was causing a great deal of harm. So this injustice, like ringing this bell, like red flag, not fair, not good, causing harm was exactly what compelled me 
to look at some of the things that I'd always been told and taught with curiosity. Okay. And so let me just say this right up front, because I know what a lot of you are thinking. Um, and I've been through this too, because in a lot of spiritual circles, and again, there's a breadth of experiences here, but in a lot of them, um, spiritual curiosity is actually punished, right? Where spiritual certainty is rewarded, right? The difference, um, a lot of us grew up in spaces where we were expected to know everything and know it right and know it like everybody else. And this is what we say, and this is what we think, and this is what we believe. And certainty was a real high value inside the community. Whereas curiosity, um, at least in my world, was always viewed with great suspicion. Like that is a sign of doubt. That is a sign of a wobbly faith. That's the beginning of the end, right? Um, the big term over that in my world was called, that's the slippery slope. Right, you ask one question, the whole thing's gonna fall apart. Um, and so, spiritual curiosity was never a treasured ideal. Um, so I did never embrace it. I was afraid to. I I was very very good at following rules. And so, if one of the rules is we don't ask these questions, that we just prioritize our absolute certainty that we're right. Well, then that's what I was going to do. Um, and so I realized that that alone has kept a lot of us away from curiosity um, because it's scary, right? It's scary to feel like we may potentially be um, disbanded from our faith community or that our very questions would threaten our sense of belonging right? And, and that that would no longer be an intact, safe place for us to, to spiritually belong. And that is a very real disincentive. And so you're not alone in that. That's, that's no joke. Um, but what I want to say to you is that I do not want you to be afraid of your own spiritual questions. In virtually every faith tradition, except for pretty modern Western faith, cur spiritual curiosity is looked on as uh, wisdom. Um, that was always a, a robust part of what would be considered growth, right? That's what, that's also called maturity. Um, just in the same way that we were understood the world before we understood suffering, before we understood diversity, um, we grow into adults and we're willing to look back at tons of those things and go, oh, that's just what I understood at third grade, right? That's just how I understood it when I was 11. Um, now I, I, I can see that in a much fuller way. S things of faith are the same. And so I don't want you to be shamed out of your own spiritual evolution. Um, I find the willingness to be curious toward things of faith as incredibly full of integrity and very, very telling that what we're prioritizing is growth and wisdom and health. Um, I'm I'm thrilled when I see that. And so no matter what you're hearing from your environment, I hope that what you can believe is that if you are looking at theology or doctrines or ideas or systems or structures, um, and with your grown up eyes, you can see some of these are causing harm, right? Some of these are built on exclusion. Um, some of these keep certain people groups absolutely disenfranchised. Um, then I would say your willingness to re-examine that particular structure is a sign of your own wisdom and intelligence. And I commend it and I applaud you. Let me bring it back to my story. Um, and Cause this is a good enough example um, to use as any. Um, I, I posted today, I don't know if it, you guys saw this, but um, let me get it just right. The Supreme Court today passed down um, a ruling that protected gay and transgender employees from discrimination inside the workplace. And it's a pretty big victory for that community who are now um, safe uh, inside their corporate and, and business structures from being fired just for being 
somewhere in the LGBTQ family, right? So I was mentioning that today and um, most of my community is like, yay, yay, yay for gay, right? Um, but there's always gonna be a handful that are like pushing on that hard. So let me talk about that for a second. Let me talk to you about, I'm gonna have to condense this wildly, but I'm gonna talk to you about my process of that ev evolution because it applies to all kinds of things. This applies to how we understand the intersection of um, faith and Black Lives Matter. This applies to how we begin to understand the intersection of faith and women in spiritual authority, right? This, it, this transcends all kinds of boundaries, um, places where faith has been used as a pretty powerful tool of disenfranchisement. In this particular community, um, let me tell you what I noticed. So what happened was with my, with my adult eyes and with a widened perspective, because what I saw at 30 was very different than what I had access to at 15, right? Just my worldview was wider. I'd seen more, I'd been to more places. My community had expanded. Um, my relationships had a lot more diversity inside of them. And I was just grown. I was just a grown person with a grown brain. Um, and so what I started to notice when I looked at the intersection of the church and the LGBTQ community is to just in a very plain and ordinary way, my normal eyes and my normal ears were showing me that there was such a great deal of harm and trauma. And that's unambiguous. Like I'm not, that I'm not, just editorializing here. I'm not making up data. I'm just saying what it was. Um, the data showed us the amount of harm. Um, the, you know, LGBTQ kids were committing suicide at seven times the normal rate, right? Kicked out of their homes at 14, broken hearts, broken bodies, broken families, um, families kicked out of their churches. It was just, it was unending, the, the trauma, unending. And that was the common story. There'd be just an occasional, that community would hold up an occasional um, objective or objection, but that was the common story. And so just, just out of my basic spiritual sensibility, Brandon and I were like, hmm, something doesn't seem to be right here. Like we're not theologians, um, we're not seminary professors, but if, if a if a piece of our faith that we have been just sort of handed and we just received without any critical thought um, that we didn't ever really personally examine or question, if that if that bit is causing this level of harm, um, again, it was injustice that compelled me towards spiritual curiosity. And so we said, what if we considered a really openly spiritually curious position, posture um, toward whatever these doctrines had had been and what they were. And so I want to tell you something that really served me at the time, because when you have been raised in a faith structure that essentially warns you off of that level of curiosity, um, and, and you know one way or another, either overtly or subtly, that even just asking the questions, but certainly if you came to a point where you reversed what you thought, or you changed your mind, or you evolved in your understanding, that that would create a lot of turmoil in your faith community, or maybe in your family or whatever, um, that could definitely be a deterrent to the work. Um, here's one I want to tell you, this was a clarifying tool for us, as we, be, as we gave ourselves permission to examine something we'd really never personally spent a lot of time examining. Um, because a lot of people are like, but the, this verse, and this word, and this thing, so Jesus gave us this really great tool and I have found this to be useful. So whatever it is you're examining, um, some of you right now are facing a faith community that is deeply um, oppositional to um, Black Lives Matter, right? So maybe that's your thing. Like, why is my church like this? Um, why are my people calling this fake? Um, right. So whatever your thing is, maybe you are inside a structure where women have no spiritual authority, um, or they are unable to use the fullness of their gifts. You, you, you put it in your brain, whatever your thing is, put it in your brain. Um, 
And so I'll use this previous example of ours as a kind of a center point. Jesus gave us this tool for discernment. Um, and he basically said, this is a pretty hardcore paraphrase, but he was like, when you are examining something, so whatever the thing is, it's a doctrine or it's a relationship or, you know, whatever. And you're not sure, you're not sure what's right, what's true, like what's good, what's good here. And I think that's what most of us want. I think I would like to give almost all of us the benefit of the doubt that when it, especially when it comes to issues of faith, we really just want to do the right thing. And I think that compels all of us. Um, most of us, I should say, we really just want to do the right thing. We want to pick the right thing. So Jesus said, all right, when you're weighing it and maybe the data is conflicting or, you know, this group of people is positive. It's this way, but this group of people also who have a lot of honor and integrity, they're positive. It's the opposite, right? And there's all this competing information and you're like, ah. He's like, here's, here's one possible way to consider what's in front of you. He's like, let's look to the fruit. And so then he gives this example and he's like, okay, here is a good tree. It's good. It's planted in good soil. It has good roots. It's healthy. So what's going to happen is when this tree grows, it's going to have beautiful fruit on it. It's going to have good fruit. That's how healthy trees, trees work. Good trees produce good fruit. And he's like, whatever here, let's say that this tree it is planted in terrible soil. It is rotten. It has a virus. The tree has a fungus. It is a unhealthy tree. What you would expect to see then, the, the natural outcome of this tree is going to be rotten fruit, right? It's going to produce bad fruit. And so if you're not sure if a tree is good or bad, look to the fruit. That's Jesus's hint to us. What are the results? The results are a pretty good indicator if that is a good tree or if it is a bad tree. And so this kept me up at night because here was the thing, as we, as we gave ourselves permission to have spiritual curiosity, we were looking at the fruit of the unaffirming Christian tree. Okay, so the, the tree that said, the only holy path for LGBTQ people is celibacy or pray it away and just make yourself straight, right? And you, we, we see how well that's worked, right? Th those are your options. Um, and and the, that tree was very much backed by all kinds of stuff. Like this is the right tree. When we looked to the fruit of that tree, it was rotten to its core absolutely full of suffering, of trauma, of self-harm, of suicide, of broken families. It was rotten. And so uh, defenders of this tree would occasionally, they would hold up out of 1,000 rotten pieces of fruit, what, there'd be one good apple. And they'd be like, look at this good apple. See? See? You can pray the gay away, right? Or see? Um, it's, it's, it's wonderful to be celibate for the rest of your life. Okay. Look at the good apple, but that was not the story of the tree. That was the rarest of exceptions. The story of the tree told us this is bad. And then we looked over here at the fruit of a church who loves and affirms their, the LGBTQ members of the body unequivocally. And the fruit was absolutely freaking incredible. And I didn't really ever know that because I never gave myself permission to look at that tree. But the tree was full of faithful people, like generous, forgiving, kind, using their gifts. It, this tree was flourishing. And nobody could say that it isn't. Again, this is just data. I'm not editorializing. This is just what the trees told me. That alone, that metric gave me enough biblical and spiritual permission to lean into those questions, to say, okay, um, I believe I, this is a tool of discernment that I am able to use as a kid of God, right? And you are too. And that's what I want to tell you. Maybe that little example is a grid in which you sort of run through your spiritual questions right now, your spiritual curiosities. What are you asking? Well, we'll look to the results. 
What are the results of the thing as you know it? Um, would you be willing to just use your eyes and ears and say, I am not sure if this is good fruit anymore. I'm not sure if it ever was, right? And where is the good fruit? So the good fruit, bad fruit paired with tons of study and examination and conversations and prayer um, brought us to the point where we were willing to say, we have evolved in our understanding of more than one thing, right? We are, we've kind of grown in this. And um, I think this is wisdom. And I think this is what maturity looks like. And here's the last thing I want to say before we quick kick over to questions from you guys. Oh, I meant to tell everybody to put questions in the chat box. Chrissy, I forgot. She told me to say two things and that was one of them. I'm sure you're doing it anyway. Oh, there they are. Forgot to be reading those. Everybody put your questions and comments in the chat box. I know it's too late. Okay. Um, um, we're going to take questions from there in just a minute. This is the, I want to say two last things. And I just want these to land right into your ears. As we discuss spiritual curiosity and advocacy, because they go together. First of all, I want you to know that privilege is a reliable enemy of discernment, okay? In other words, the more privilege we have, the more we should consider taking a really hard look at what we understand, okay? Because privilege takes us as far as possible away from the margins. It puts us in the center of the story, which is not the normal story, right? And so the more we have, the less likely we are to understand what is probably actually going on. Like for example, I've said this before, I'm in virtually every single category of privilege, almost across the board. I am white, I am straight, I am married, I have, well, okay, my hair used to be blonde. <laughs> it's blonde with dye, right? I got the right look. Uh, I've been married for a long time. I got this little family. I've got enough money. The only category that I do not occupy to put me in the dead bullseye of privilege is that I'm a girl, right? If I was a man, I'd be king of the hill. And so what that tells me is I am so far removed from the margins that it is right for me to question what I think is true, real, and going on, okay? So if that's you, consider that you might not be able to deeply trust your own discernment of what is actually unjust in the world. My answer to this is always the same. I 100% listen to the voices and the experiences of people who are disenfranchised, always. And I believe them. I believe them. I believe when they say, this is our lived experience. And just because I have never experienced it does not make it not true, right? I always listen to them first, always. Even when something pops up in the news and I'm not even sure how to interpret it, boom, I'll send a text to several of my like either friends of color or my gay friends or whatever. And I'm like, what do you think of this? Like I try to, I run it through their ears and right away they show me things that I literally could not even see because it didn't affect me in the same way. So privilege is a reliable enemy of discernment. And here's the last thing I wanna say, and then we move on to questions. Discomfort is the precursor to growth. A lot of you, a lot of us are uncomfortable right now. We are experiencing cultural discomfort in a way that I can't really remember in my adult life, right? And, and, and it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. Um, but a lot of people don't know what to do with the feelings. I'm uncomfortable. Some of these forms that I have kind of counted on or that I've always held as normal are being very, are being pushed upon and I don't know how to feel. Well, here's the good news. Discomfort comes right before growth. So if, if we're willing to stay in it, if we are willing to sit in the pocket of other people's pain, of injustice that is raging all around us and has been forever. If we'll stay instead of pushing the discomfort away, instead of um, explaining it away, um, instead of denying it or just ignoring it, all of those will put a buffer between us and discomfort. If instead we will choose to sit in it and stay in it with our neighbors, with our communities, 
the very next stage is growth. And that is really what we are after here. That is what we're looking for, spiritual maturity. And so please be willing to stay uncomfortable longer than you want to. Please be willing to sit in the pocket right now of suffering, um, of, of tears, of inequality um, and fear and brutality. Um, stay there longer than you want to. And I believe as a community, we will experience cultural growth that we maybe haven't ever seen yet. And so that's my hope. That is my hope. What did I tell you? I was gonna preach. This was gonna be my pulpit right here in my office. And I went right, like my face is hot. Do I look red? I feel hot. Like, is my neck red? <sighs> okay. I went longer than I wanted, Christy. Thank you for letting me just say everything that I wanted to say. Okay. Okay. I would love to take some questions. All right. We are going to go first to Samantha Lawson. So I'm going to unmute okay. her right now. There you go. Hi, Samantha. Hi. <laughs> I um, just really appreciate all of your words. And I just want to walk around my neighborhood with your voice on a loudspeaker. <laughs> But th that's my issue. I'm currently dealing with friends and family who are either white and privileged or totally oblivious or I don't know what. And it's, I'm trying hard to love them anyway. And I just, I don't, I, I need help knowing how to talk to them when they're just so clueless. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you are 100% not alone right now. Um, I think anytime we are going to, even just grab the very edge of what is potentially a cultural shakedown of this magnitude, right? When not just the United States, but the world is raising a collective voice against white supremacy, we are going to see that discomfort deeply affect our friends and our family members who have never ever chosen to feel any of that or experience any of it. Because it is a choice, it's a luxury not to. Right. The, again, the more privileged we are, the least, the less discerning we are. It is our luxury to stay in the center of the bullseye and not let anybody else's pain affect us. So that's what we're collectively experiencing right now is this shakedown of what used to be white comfort. OK, which is powerful. White comfort is powerful and we will do a great deal to protect it. Um, and so you're just one person. Remember that. OK. Also, I want you to remember this. It is not your responsibility to do the heavy emotional and spiritual lifting for everybody in your life. Frankly, you cannot do it. If somebody does not want to deeply examine their own bias, um, their own inherent racism, which we all just got when we we're born, right? We just, that's the air we've breathed. It's, it's not your work or your responsibility to make them see that. They have to want to. They have to want to, there's no other way. Um, it's too painful to confront. It requires too much humility. Um, it requires too much shared sorrow and we prefer comfort. Um, and so the best thing that you can do is first of all, take that off your plate. You're not, you're not in charge of them. You are not in charge of them. You are not responsible for them. You cannot fix them. You cannot make them understand against their own will. Okay, take all that off your plate, every bit of it. What you can say, what you can do is just what's true and good. There you go, that's it. You can say what's true and good. Um, one thing that nobody can ever really argue with is your perspective. So that sometimes that means you coming into your own, into a conversation with somebody or on your social media spaces and saying, one thing I'm learning right now is, one conversation I'm having right now is, a book that is deeply affecting me that I am really listening to is um, this perspective from such and such leader of color, put in quotes, is really making me think today. Nobody can, nobody. This is unimpeachable content, right? And so what that is, is you putting your learning experience in front of your people and, and the responsibility and onus is on them. If they want to examine it, if they want to look at it, um, if they are willing to do that hard work, I hope that they are. But your, I, I do not want you to undermine, to underestimate your consistent witness here. It matters. It matters. 
It matters that people see you constantly bearing a meaningful testimony to the work of anti-racism. It's not small. It's not small. Uh, it's and and the good news is it's the only thing you're responsible for. That's it. That's all. That's your work. I commend you. I really do. I understand that this creates discomfort. Again, discomfort precedes growth. And so let's not be so quick to eject discomfort from every relationship, from every conversation. Um, frankly, we are in need of discomfort right now. If discomfort precedes growth culturally, we're 400 years past due, right? And so may we keep our foot on the gas of discomfort as long as it takes. Thank you for asking that good question. A ton of people in here are probably thinking the exact same thing. Okay, what else we got? All right, we have a question from Tamara Tate. Unmuting her. her. Hi, Tamara. Hello, thank you for all your leadership. Um, my question is how do you not get weary I just finished walking my church through an anti, you know, learning how to be inclusive about LGBTQ people. Hmm. And now we're trying to educate on anti-black racism and it's not my day job. I'm tired. I don't know how, how do we keep doing this without getting weary? Yeah. Right. Um, I hope this doesn't sound trite because I, I mean this as sincerely as I possibly can without it seeming I don't know how this is gonna sound. One thing that helps me um, in that kind of space that you just described is when I think about my friends that I cherish, when I think about my kids who live in black skin, um, my members of my church who are just impossibly dear to me who live inside of brown or black skin or they live inside of a body who is lgbtq they don't ever get a break never they never get one minute away from the skin they're in right they don't ever get to lay it down um, and just simply walk around unencumbered and somehow that helps me stay the course um, that in joining them in their own fight for right. dignity and equality, our beloved people who don't even have the luxury to be like, I got to just put this down because this isn't my day job either. Right. Um, when I think that they don't get that chance, it helps me forego my own luxury. Right, but a little bit more pragmatically to your question, I have found I don't unmatched comfort and renewal when I, um, it's not that I purged my community, I don't quite know how to say this right, but when my community shifted both online, but also in my real life um, to some degree, and now I am primarily surrounded by really like-minded people. Like we're in it together. We are all on the same side of the thing. We are rowing the boat together. Um, we can sit around on the porch in absolute lockstep with one another on what we're thinking, on what we're feeling, on what is outraging us, um, on what we're sad about. It's so comforting to not always be going against the grain but to have at least a small bit of your community who is like, we're in this together. It's comforting. It's really, really comforting. And so I hope, I'm so happy to hear about the work of your church. Well done, like good job. I'm so glad that you have found a faith community committed to justice. That is wonderful. I hope you can also lean on them as like essentially co-conspirators, right? And collaborators that you're together. You're not alone in the work. Um, and thus you can create even among you pockets of laughter, right? And joy and fun and release and relief, um, because you know that collectively, um, you're going to stay the course. And so thanks for asking. Thanks for doing the work. It makes me feel really proud of you, proud of your church. Um, boy, that's going to matter. Can you just imagine the levels of freedom? that are just gonna roll down from this for the next generation. It just feels 
monumentally important right now. Thank you. Thank you for that good question. What you got, Chrissy? All right, we are going to Christina Height. Looking for you. Okay. Hi, Jen. I'm trying okay. to. Okay, there you are. I see you. I got you. Okay, hi. So um, I love the idea of identifying what we would march for. And I feel like I have a handful of those things identified. And I've been learning about them for several years and volunteering and giving and advocating toward those things. My struggle seems to come when injustices seem to all be interconnected. So like mm. foster care is connected to mm. racism and homelessness, sure. and poverty and incarceration. Okay. And then I start thinking, um, how do I stay focused on a few without going to those others? And to yeah. tie that last week, how do I say yes to my things and then trust that others will say yes to theirs? And yeah. Taken care of. This is the problem. <laughs> I liken this. Um, I've, I've used this uh, example before to describe what you just talked about which is like pulling the thread it's like you have this big bundle and you start pulling it you're like well what I'm going to care about is racism right but then you pull a little bit more and you're like oh my, why are why are all these kids in foster care and then you pull it you're like why are they all going to prison as soon as they get out of high school right and, and then before you know it the whole damn thing is unraveled it's just a pile of threads and so that is how injustice works like injustice is very intersectional and it absolutely steamrolls across all sorts of boundaries and, 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 and sort of edges. It's overwhelming. And so one thing we've had to learn, because Brandon and I, our hearts beat for this. And this is a lot of our, just the work of our adult life too. Um, and this is, I hope this doesn't sound like an excuse. It's really just a, a admission of limitations that we can, we can do what we can do. <laughs> I mean, we can do what we can do. And so we have found um, more meaningful, um, I don't know if results is really the right word, but even just participation when our focus is slightly more narrow, when we say more or less, knowing that these categories are gonna bleed into others, more or less, these are some of the big high level injust factors of injustice that we are going to care about, that we are going to use our influence for, that we are going to put our dollars to, because um, money matters, you guys, where we are, who we are funding, where we are spending a huge player um, in writing inequality. Um, these are the things that we're going to really, really use our microphone and our megaphone for. Um, and we do just have to trust that there are other people stepping into advocacy in some of those other categories, because the truth is none of us can pick them all. Just none of us, we, we won't get anything done. We won't go anywhere. Um, we'll just be overwhelmed. Um, and so I think this is a matter of internal permission to say all of these things suck. I hate them all. I hate white supremacy. Um, I hate inequality inside the foster system. Like I hate the school to prison pipeline. I hate it all. These are the two or three that I'm going to really spend my energy toward the most, trying to make the biggest dent that I can, um, the longest road in the same direction. And there's a lot of joy in that. I think there's a lot of momentum. And then there's a lot of possibility because we just have more energy to give to it. And so if we can kind of self-select down to the things that make our hearts beat the hardest, and usually our bodies will tell us, our bodies, our feelings, our tears, they usually point the right direction. These are the things that matter to you most. And then we follow those wholeheartedly. I just think we could just get anything done. I, I just, we're all going to pick something. Um, and I believe inside that sort of focused work, we can make the biggest headway. It's a great question. Thanks for caring too much. I get it. I get it. What else? All right, Jen, Heather Blanchett on Vimeo would like to know if you could have lunch with five women in the world, who would they be in mind? Heather, I wasn't ready. Okay. I just want to say that maybe if I had more time to think about this, I might have, this might look different. Okay. This is a, five is a lot. Okay. Did you say um, it could be anybody? What was the rules? She said five women in the world. Okay, five women in the world. Okay, okay. 
no big surprise. Michelle Obama. <laughs> I'm so obsessed and I'm not sorry. Okay. I'm not sorry. I love her. I love her. Did anybody go to her, the Becoming tour? I don't know if anybody went to that. Yeah, I did too. I cried through the entire thing. I cried all my makeup off. Did anybody read her book, Becoming? Well, you should. Everybody go buy it because that was the number one book of 2019, um, which is maybe like the last good thing that happened in the world. Okay. Um, Michelle Obama, Tina Fey. <laughs> Guys, she's my hero. She's my comedy patroness. Smart and funny is my favorite combination. Um, and she is so smart and funny. She can, she, she could do anything. I would just walk around and just carry her bags. Um, I'm going to say, I need to pull in, I need to pull in Amy Poehler because the one, two punch of those girls is too good for this world. Right. Um, talk about smart and funny, the both of them, any parks and rec fans in here. Yeah. Yeah. I think I've been through the whole thing like three times. I cannot ever get enough of lesson note for the rest of my life. Um, hold on. Chrissy, who else do we put on our short list? RBG probably. Oh my gosh, Chrissy. Yes. I knew I should have asked you. Um, yes, yes. RBG for sure. Talk about fierce. I wrote about her. Do you guys remember that I included a little thing about her in the chapter on mega mezzo modest rbg i'm always like god protect her protect her health give her breath in her lungs like we need her um and then i think maybe i would pick malala i'd like to hear from that young fierce thing right what a girl what a girl what a special human being um i think i'd like to have her at the table too that's a good, I want to have that dinner. That's a good dinner right there. That's a good question. I don't think I've changed my answers. That's what they are. They stand. Okay. What else? Okay. I'm going to unmute Christine mm -hmm. as a question for you. Okay. Hello. Hi, Christine. Hi. So how do you engage in advocacy when the introvert inside of you seems to keep you tethered or maybe even a little afraid to step outside your comfort zone, even though you are so strongly, very passionate about the cause. Hmm. You know, I'm an introvert. I don't know if you knew that. I think I actually mentioned that in fierce. Um, so I deeply understand the impulse um, of energy preservation, if you will, and how many moving parts and how much stimulus you can actually handle before you just absolutely have a freaking meltdown. Right. Um, so here's the good news about advocacy. It comes in tons of forms. So it doesn't all look like a big, noisy, crowded march. Um, although those are incredibly exciting, even for this introvert. I cannot get enough of a march, you guys. They're so powerful. But advocacy, advocacy looks like all kinds of stuff. It can look like one-on-one -on -one conversations, which are right in the introvert's wheelhouse. It can look like fundraising. Money matters. I'll say it again. Um, just money goes to the center of the bullseye stuff. It rarely finds its way to the margins. And so um, it can look like fundraising. Um, it could look like how you lead and speak on your social media spaces, which also can be an introvert's gift. Um, it can look like conversations that you foster inside small communities, your little church, um, your little neighborhood, your little mom's group. It doesn't always have to be big. It doesn't always have to be loud. Um, sometimes it looks like raising awareness. Um, which we could do with all kinds of, all kinds of gifts play into advocacy, graphic design, a real um, interesting intelligence toward marketing promotion, um, art, music. There's just so many interesting ways to advocate with what we have, with who we are, with what we're good at, um, with the channels and the resources already available to us. So I encourage you to think creatively. Who am I? 
what do I have to offer? What am I good at? Where is my influence? And then use it in ways that make sense to your own integrity. It all matters. Some people are going to be at the front of the march in the megaphone. That's going to be some people. Some people are going to be um, building the graphic design for the flyer to invite everybody to the march, right? Everything matters. Everything counts. Um, and so I really take a deep look at who you are, what you have in your hand, and how can you use it for good? That's and thanks for asking that great question. And then go home and take a nap um, yeah. because that is our That's only good. possibility great. for recovery, us yeah. poor, poor introverts. Guys, also introverts right now in quarantine, everybody just needs to get the hell out of our houses. I'm not kidding. <laughs> like, get the hell out of my house. Um, I like being home alone. That's I've always been a homebody, but I don't want anybody else here. That's the problem. They're ruining it. So um, deep, deep connection to you on the introvert question. We probably have time for two more. I know we've gone over our time a little bit more, but you guys manage this in the middle of the day. You can manage five more minutes. Maybe two more, Chrissy. Okay. So this is from Elizabeth Wild on Vimeo. She mm -hmm. said, how do we enlighten our children in ways of the world while still allowing them to have their own opinions? I don't want my sons to just repeat what we say, but to have their own reasons to support their beliefs. Hmm. That's a good question, Elizabeth. Thanks for asking that parenting question right now, because this matters. Our kids are watching right now. Um, you know, this is a this is an, a new world for them to observe in many cases um, at this level, at this capacity, at this scope. Um, so one um, really reliable way to introduce your kids to advocacy without necessarily just imprinting although I'm not afraid to imprint, by the way. I mean, I will 100% like churn out a bunch of liberals out of this house. I'm not worried about it, okay? But um, is to simply teach your children real history. You don't even have to embellish, right? You don't even have to draw a lot of conclusions. Um, but for you to say, let's kind of look at the, let's just read like a real factual account of the history of racism and white supremacy that um, built our country from scratch. We'll just have a look at the facts. Let's just look at the history of it. Um, you know, we, we're gonna trace the history of women's rights and what they were unable to do even a hundred years ago, right? This is what, these were some rules that our country put over the lives and bodies of women two generations ago. We'll just look at the facts, right? And then, let history be its own teacher um, let your kids draw their conclusions. The kids are smart. They're not dumb. And kids are going to be naturally drawn more toward what is good and right, right? Before they've been very corrupted by this world, like most of us have been, um, they're, they're more pure. Um, they have an innocence to them. They, um, they have less baggage to wade through to get to what is true and good. And so um, I'm a big fan like, let's watch this documentary. Let's watch this movie together. Let's, let's sort of read through some of this, this material together. Um, but also, I don't think there's anything wrong at all with letting them hear loud and clear your convictions on justice, right? Don't, don't get that mixed. That's important. I think it's important that our kids hear their parents right now on the side of justice hear their parents saying out loud, this is not right and this is what we're going to do. Um, hear, hear those conversations being normalized around their dining room tables. I mean, this is how we raise kids um, who will know how to do the right thing. And so I wouldn't hold back your opinions too much unless they're terrible because I don't know you. And so could you please fact check your opinions with some other people and see if they're good or not? Um, but if they are on the side of justice and truth, and you, I think you should say them loud and proud right in your own house, right? Thank you for that. One more, Chrissy. All right. Our last question is going to be from Denise. Unmuting you now, Denise. Hi, Jen. Denise. Hi, Hi, how are you? Good. So my husband and I just found out this weekend that we will be moving from Central California to Kerrville, Texas. Whoa. And we're moving a family of six since we have four adopted littles. Yep. 
And as we're looking for a new church community, yeah, I wonder how you would suggest, like we already made a list of non-negotiables for what we want from a church, but how would you suggest we start looking for that so that as quickly mm. as possible, we can kind of weed our way through where we're going to attend so mm. that they have the activism, the inclusionary Christianity. It's good. Um, oh, you guys, church shopping is the worst. Oh, it's so the worst. It can be so discouraging. And right when you think maybe this is starting to feel like this might work, then the pastor says something so problematic. And you're like, oh, we got to start over again. Um, so first of all, my sympathies. Um, but I, there's no right exact way to do this, especially when you're moving to an absolute new community where you probably don't know anybody. Because um, sometimes you can use the people that you know um, who are pretty usually right about what they recommend, especially when you put in your key non-negotiables. That really whittles it down. Um, here's the good news. The internet is an incredible source with those exact same buzzwords. Um, and so you've probably already done this, but I would start researching online churches with some super clear language in your Google bar that matters to you because the churches that deeply um, are deeply convicted about those sorts of things, this will be on their website. It will be in their materials. It will be in their mission statements. It will not be ambiguous. It will not be so weirdly vague that you're like, what does that even mean? The vaguer the language, the probably more harmful it actually is in practice. Does that make sense? Because nobody wants to put it down in print. And so it just sounds like, it's just like, everybody is just going to be great here. You're like, yeah, but what about the gay people? Are they going to be great here? Right. And so um, if, if that particular um, filter is something that matters to you for that community, there's an incredible website called churchclarity.com. And their mission is to create this national database of churches um, who are not ambiguously affirming of the LG, you know, they're, they're all, the LGBTQ members are um, cherished and they're at all levels of leadership and all that. And so um, that is a really, really great place to start. And one thing that we've noticed is that more or less with exceptions, um, when you find a church who is really committed to the gay community, they tend to be committed to a lot of areas, a lot of communities who are suffering injustice. Um, it kind of goes together. Um, and so churchclarity.com is a decent place to start. Um, and then I don't know if this is good advice or not. So maybe just don't take this, but I, how old are your kids? Can you unmute her Chrissy real quick? Yep, one moment. Denise, can she unmute herself? Oh no, you're in control. No. You're Wait, you're I the wizard. Hang on, I, think I, I just unmuted Denise, there. but that's okay. Not. I'm back. Okay, three, yeah. four, five, and six. Did you hear me? They're yes. They're I'm in shock. Remember, they're through adoption. Three, four, three, four five, and five, six. six. God. Oh my gosh. Okay take this or leave it. But especially when they're little like this and getting to church is like a freaking act of God, right? Um, I just almost murdered somebody every single Sunday when my kids were little. I just, sometimes I thought I'll just drive my car right into a tree and we'll just all be better. Um, consider while you're looking in that weird time when you're really vetting, maybe just one of you goes to church. And the other one stays home with the littles. And it's not this huge ordeal. And you put your kids into a church where you don't actually know what they're teaching yet. And you don't know what they're going to hear in kids ministry. And it already took a hundred hours to get there. And you're sweaty. And you're like, and it's going to be summer here. And it's terrible. It's terrible. Reconsider. Like reconsider. <laughs> Move here in October. It's a terrible time to come here. But I'm just there is potentially some wisdom in sending one spouse to church as like tribute, like go get a feel. 
um, before we drag us all there and it's a nightmare or they hear some horrible thing in the kids ministry um, and we have to undo the damage. Just a thought. It's okay. God will still love you if you don't all go to church for a few weeks. All right. <laughs> that is just okay. You're already going to be so depressed from how hot you are that it's just okay to stay home and like recover in your air conditioning. And I'm not kidding. Chrissy knows Chrissy's in, da in Dallas. It's just, we suffer in Texas in the summer. It's like some sort of punishment. You'll be really glad you live here this winter. Okay. Okay, everybody. That's it. That's it. Chrissy, can you unmute everybody just so we can um, like say our voices and say our goodbyes. And I just like that part. Just the whole everybody. Yay. Okay. Let's hear it. Bye. No, Chrissy, you muted them. Listen, I don't know how to unmute everyone at the same time, so I'm just going to one of the Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Okay, Love you so much. Yeah. Love you so much. Thank you. Next you. Week. Next week. <laughs> awesome. Love you Thank you. <laughs> Love you, too. <laughs> Bye, Jen. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. See you next week. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Oh, bye. Keep going. Keep going. So <laughs> many beautiful faces. <laughs> bye, Jen. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 See y'all next week. Bye, Jen. Thanks.